And welcome into Real Deal Sports Talk with KP. It's your boy coming at you Sunday after the draft. I hope everybody's had a chance to get their heads clear. We got some beautiful weather going on. Uh, maybe some snow moving into you know the Colorado area uh, tonight. But I hope everybody's good. We got NBA playoffs going on. We got NHL playoffs going on. We've got uh, lacrosse playoffs going on. So all kinds of excitement in the sports world. A lot to talk about. Maybe your head was clouded. Maybe you've come to from all watching all of the drafts, seeing every pick, making all your notes like I did, breaking it all down, hearing all the coverage trying to stay up on social media, and all the different things that were going around this weekend with the draft. Today is my draft recap show. I'm going to kind of go through each division, each team. At the end, after I've broke that down, I'll tell you which team out of each division that I choose, I think, had the best draft. Um, Then we'll get into some of the NBA playoffs. We've got uh, Milwaukee and Boston. They're playing right now in the fourth quarter. And then Golden State also is taking on Houston today. We had a big thriller last night in a Game 7 between Denver and San Antonio we'll talk about. And then at the end of the show, I want to give a tribute to a fallen coach. So let's get into it. We'll start with the NFC North. We'll work all the way through the AFC West, going division by division. Uh, Starting, we'll go through the teams alphabetically pretty much through each division. These are not set up based on ranking of any kind. Uh, I'm just going to let you know if I like their draft, what picks I liked, if there was a pick that I I, I kind of question or I'm not sure about how the fit is or where they took the guy in the draft. Um, and I'll tell you how many picks each team had also because to me that's interesting and what they were able to do with the number of picks they had. So starting with the Chicago Bears, I liked their draft. They didn't have their first pick until number 73. They only had five picks total in the draft, but two of their picks I really like. These are guys that are going to kick in, probably start and or contribute heavily in their rookie years in running back David Montgomery at 73 and wide receiver Riley Ridley at 126. Riley Ridley, he fell down during the draft process. I personally had him graded a little higher. I think that's a steal of a pick for Chicago. The other three picks they got, you're looking at them mostly as depth type guys, uh, special teams maybe, but getting two guys out of five picks that probably become starters and or heavily contribute to your team when you only have five and your first pick isn't later in the third round, that's pretty good. So I'm up on the Chicago Bears draft. The Detroit Lions, um... I'm kind of split. You guys know they're my favorite team. I rep them forever. Um, Parts of the draft I was down. Parts of the draft I was up. Ultimately, I ended up being up on their draft. I like the TJ Hawkinson pick a lot. Uh, I've really questioned the Jelani Tavai pick. I know the story came out that maybe New England was looking at him also. I think maybe that's just, you know, taking care of your guys type of a thing. Because Jelani Tavai, I mean, every station that was covering it, every channel, NFL Network, ESPN, ABC, glossed over the pick. It's like they were not prepared to talk about this guy. This was not somebody they had put a lot of film in. They had some film of him, but it was like, oh my goodness, who did they just pick? I looked into the guy, and okay, I can kind of see him being a Teddy Bruschi type in Patricia's defense in that New England style let's pick this one thing that this guy does well and we're going to use that to our advantage that's how I see Jelani Tavai in this defense I question the pick at 43 with all of the other players that were available there but whatever I like the Will Harris pick at 81 that safety even though the safety room's a little full right now he'll play some special teams and he might be able to contribute in some of these different packages that Detroit has liked to play with with multiple three four safeties on the field at times austin bryant at 117 the defensive end i like that i i 
a lot of talk about him being stiff in the hips. That's something with coaching. Again, they're going to find what this guy does, and they're going to use take advantage of that skill set. And I also like the long corner, the tall corner they got out of Penn State at 146, Amani Aroria, I think is how you pronounce it. Um, so out of those picks, you know you get four guys that – could contribute early. Uh, Isaac Nwada, the tight end out of Georgia, you could see him getting some special teams, maybe some blocking tight end reps if he makes the squad. Uh, Travis Fulgham, the wide receiver out of Old Dominion, decent pick, not great, don't really expect a lot out of him, but four out of their first five picks, solid guys, and uh, Jelani Tavai could you know turn into be a player. Nobody really saw Teddy Bruschi coming out of Arizona the way he came out and developed and turned into such a great pro. Maybe Jelani's got a similar trajectory as far as his goes. Green Bay, I'm high on theirs as well. The picks of Rashawn Gary, Darnell Savage, and Elton Jenkins. I like all of those picks. Jenkins probably steps in right away with the loss of the guard there for Green Bay in the offseason. Other picks, mostly depth players, solid guys, trait guys. You're going to see a lot of that after you know the first couple picks in the draft. Not a lot of people, in my opinion, hit late in the draft. Vikings, face it, 12 picks. They hit everything they could. They hit depth. They tried to hit for starters in Garrett Bradbury at 18, at Irv Smith Jr. at 50. He'll be there with Kyle Rudolph. Now you have two solid tight ends. You have the receivers. You have a running game there. You bring in and Alexander Madison to pair with the Delvin Cook. Gives you kind of a one-two punch. Um, and then you got a bunch of depth plays. And with 12 players, it's like, let's get them out there. Let's see what we got. Best player is going to move forward. So I'm also high on that draft. Everybody in the NFC North, I like the draft that they put together. Conversely, NFC South, I'm kind of like, eh, on everybody in the NFC South. Uh, Chris Lindstrom, I think they went a little high to get the guard at 14 there. Solid player, going to be a 10-year starter. I just think they reached a little bit. Uh, Caleb McGarry, the tackle, they're clearly trying to protect Matt Ryan. Uh, I think they could have got him a little lower than 31 also. And then Kendall Shelford, Pro- Sheffield, probably my favorite pick of Atlanta uh, in the draft at 111 just because of the value they're getting there. John Kaminsky, the defensive end, is an interesting one. Um, But really, their best three picks were their first three picks in Lindstrom, McGarry, and Sheffield, even though I think they reached on two of those. That's why I'm a little like, eh, on their draft. Carolina Panthers, I like the Brian Burns pick. He probably comes in and plays a little bit of that um, Julius Peppers type role for him. They might try to you know, get him a little more pass rush. I know he's listed at outside linebacker. They probably try and put 10, 15 more pounds on him and have him be that defensive end type. So I like that pick. Greg Little, decent pick at 37. Will Greer, the quarterback at 100. This one's kind of puzzling to me because it's similar, I guess you could say, style to Cam Newton because of his mobility. But they came up in a little bit different systems, playing it in different ways. Uh, Will Greer is much shorter than Cam Newton is. He's not as big a bodied. So you are going to have to change the offense somewhat for his skill set. Can he develop behind Cam? Can he be the guy if Cam's shoulder's not ready? If Cam goes down again during the season? Sure. With the weapons that you have there, with a Curtis Samuel, with a Christian McCaffrey, um, I think you have enough going there to where he he won't fail you, but I don't see him developing behind Cam to be the next starter of the Carolina Panthers moving forward. And then the rest of the guys, you know, depth trait type guys, they didn't have a lot of picks in this draft, only seven. Atlanta had seven. So they did with it what they could. Uh, the Saints had five picks in this draft, kind of like uh, with them also, but they didn't have their first pick until 48 where they took the center, Eric McCoy. He's going to step in and play day one, probably a 10-year starter. I also like to pick at 244. This is a team that I do think hit on somebody late in the draft in Caden Ellis. His father, Luther Ellis, longtime NFL defensive tackle, played for the Lions, played for uh, Denver, I believe. He's the chaplain, I think, for Denver right now. But this is just this is a football playing kid. He may not be the fastest. He may not be the strongest. He's coming out of uh, Idaho, I believe, 
and uh, he's just a football player. Probably contributes mostly on special teams, but I think he has a very good shot of making that Saints roster. And then Tampa Bay with their eight picks, they had probably the best pick in the division getting Devin White. He's going to start. You follow with a Sean Bunting, good pick there. They take the kicker, Matt Gay, at 145, maybe a little early, but they got their guy. Um, interesting to see how they're putting it together, but that Devin White pick was huge for them. Moving into the NFC East, Dallas with eight picks. The only pick I really like was the depth they added to their offensive line at 90, Connor McGovern. The rest of them, there was other players. There was better players. There was guys who seemingly fit their system available just about at every pick. Uh, until you get maybe down to 213, where they take a, a Devon Wilson, the safety, where they get 218, Mike Weber, the running back, and 241, Jalen Jelks, the defensive end. But before that, they just about every pick, there was somebody better available, even at the position they chose. So eh, I'm a little down, like, okay, draft for Dallas Cowboys. New York Giants, they had 10 picks in this draft. And for the most part, they made the most of them. Uh, Their pick at 180, Corey Ballantyne, the cornerback, he's already been shot. He was shot late Sunday or Sunday morning, uh, but should be fine moving forward. So there's that note if you haven't heard that yet. And then their first pick, Daniel Jones, the quarterback at six. Super reach. If I'm the Giants, I probably trade back. I probably turn my 10 picks into more picks or collect picks for next year's draft. If I really wanted Daniel Jones, I don't see anybody else in the top 10 at least taking him. So they could have picked up more draft capital. Daniel Jones, they're already saying maybe he sits two or three years behind an Eli Manning. That's a little rough right there. You got your first pick in the top 10 and he's not going to play for a few years. I get the concept, but generally you take those guys later in the draft. Dexter Lawrence was a good pick for them. DeAndre Baker was a good pick for them. Um, I like O'Shane Eximmons and George Asafo Adigi, the guard. I like that pick at 232, hitting on somebody late in the draft. So, eh, eh, draft for the Giants. Um, Philadelphia, kind of an eh, eh, not really thrilled, not really too excited about their draft. They get the tackle Andre Dillard. He probably replaces Jason Peters on that left side eventually. Miles Sanders, the running back. J.J. Arcega, white side, the wide receiver. He could step in and start. Only having five picks, though, it's a little hard to get excited about the draft because they're sitting around waiting for a lot of guys to come off the board before Philadelphia had a chance to do their thing. They do get Carson Wentz another backup at 167 with Clayton Thorson, a four-year starter, so could be a good pick there value-wise late in the draft if he works out. Washington had 10 picks in this draft. Uh, They hit huge on Dwayne Haskins. They hit huge on Montez Sweet if that heart condition really isn't an issue. They hit even bigger on Bryce Love at 112. This is a guy, had he come out last year, would have probably been a first-round pick, top 15 type guy. They get him at 112, so that's huge there. They get to tackling machine Cole Holcomb at 173. Very good draft for Washington. When I kind of expected coming into it, especially after the Dan Snyder news broke that he was taking over the draft, that they were going to blow it up and ruin it. And they ended up having a pretty decent, pretty good draft overall. NFC West, we have the Arizona Cardinals. They had 11 picks in the draft, okay? 11 picks, a lot of picks for the Cardinals. And they hit on their first seven. Kyler Murray, quarterback at number one. At 33, Byron Murphy, the cornerback. At 62, Andy Isabella, the wide receiver. At 65, Zach Allen, the defensive end. At 103, they get Hakeem Butler, the wide receiver. At 139, they get Deontay Thompson, the safety. And at 174, Keyshawn Johnson, the wide receiver, who could be one of the better receivers overall in this draft as he translates to the NFL. They get him super value-wise at 174. So their first seven picks hit. Just amazing draft. I don't know if that's just Cliff Kingsbury. I don't know if Steve Klein finally figured out what he was doing and he just needed to fail a couple times to get it going. But the Cardinals hit and they hit hard in this draft. Uh, L.A. Rams, 
I like the uh, Darrell Henderson running back pick. He kind of comes in, gives that extra line of defense for Zach, or extra line of protection for uh, Zach Brown and Todd Gurley in case one of them goes down. I also like the pick at 251 of Dakota Allen, the linebacker, the last chance you kid from uh, Texas Tech. He's rehabilitated himself. He's come back. He's made the most of his second chance. Probably contributes on special teams. Maybe tries to earn his way into that Mark Barron type role for this team. But at 251, I'm glad Dakota Allen was able to get drafted. Outside of that, I'm kind of like, eh, on the Rams' eight draft picks. San Francisco, they also had eight draft picks. And they had... uh, as, and I'm going to put politics aside, as I have to with a lot of this stuff. Otherwise, I wouldn't count the Nick Bosa pick as being a good one. Uh, but they get Nick Bosa. They get Debo Samuel. They get Jalen Hurd. Those two picks right there, it's like, okay, I see what you're doing, Kyle Shanahan. I see you, San Francisco. You, you got some tricky stuff coming our way, and we're going to see it happen. Because that Jalen Hurd, remember, he was a running back at Tennessee. He transferred from Tennessee, went to another school to get to Baylor so he could play receiver because he thought ultimately – at six foot four, six foot five, moving forward, he had a better chance playing receiver and making it that way as opposed to being a running back at that height and trying to make it that way. So very versatile player there. I also like the Dre Greenlaw pick, the outside linebacker, and they get Mitch Witznowski at punter as well. So San Francisco solid draft. I like that one. I like what I like most about Seattle's draft is the fact they went from four picks to eleven. That is moving, that is wheeling and dealing, that is impressive stuff to be done, that is commendable. They get LJ Collier, the defensive end at 20, (coughs) excuse me, at 29. They get great value on somebody who a lot of people were pushing up into the early first round, including me thinking maybe it was the ultimate Raider surprise in the wide receiver DJ DK Metcalf at 64. Uh, Gary Jennings Jr., the wide receiver at 120. And then they get another receiver, John Ursua, wide receiver at 236. So you've got three different style body types, three different skill set wide receivers for the quarterback you just signed back to a huge huge deal in Russell Wilson. You hear that some of the uh, Doug Baldwin might be gone. Tyler Lockett's still been doing his thing. So this is going to be a fast offense. They're still going to run the ball, but you can see they're getting Russell Wilson weapons. They're not going to pay him that much and be a constantly running team. So they're getting him weapons. They're getting him big guys. They're getting him quick guys. They're getting him uh, uh, twitchy guys. And then they also pick up the local kid at 142, Ben burr Curvin, who's just a tackling machine. So I like that pick as well. AFC North, we've got Baltimore. They had eight picks in this draft. I think they hit on at least four of them. Marquise Brown, Jalen Ferguson, Miles Boykin, and Justice Hill. I mean, hey, you got Jackson back there at quarterback. Let's get him some weapons in Boykin and Brown. Jalen Ferguson, all-time sack leader in the FBS history. So we'll put him into that defense. We'll start grooming him up. And then Justice Hill, the running back from uh, Oklahoma State, he slips all the way to 113. You're going to pair him with um, Ingram coming over from the Saints. Now you've got a good running back situation in the backfield, a young quarterback, big receivers, guy who can take the top off. Interesting moves being made by Baltimore with their eight. Cincinnati had 10 picks. I'm kind of like, eh, on their draft. They do get the tackle Jonah Williams, 10-year starter there. Drew Simple, the tight end, good, decent pick at 52. Rennell Wren, defensive tackle at 125, probably the best value they got in the draft. And then Taylor brings in his quarterback guy, Ryan Finley, who could step in. He's an older rookie now, 24, 25 years old, for Dalton if they decide not to move forward with Dalton. Uh, the Browns had seven picks. I think they hit on their first four, even though they didn't have one until 46. Greedy Williams drops to them at that point. You're going to pair him with last year's guy. A lot of pieces on that defense, a lot of pieces on that offense. Again, the swag pound on paper looks ridiculous. They're going to have to put it together. Freddie Kitchens is going to have to do an amazing job coaching and managing personalities. But this team right now looks like they are set to compete, and they look like they're set to complete compete for a while moving forward. At 80, they get Sione Takitaki. 
inside linebacker, solid guy, solid player. Uh, at 119, Sheldrick Redwine, the safety, and then 155, Mac Wilson, the inside linebacker. All of these four players could be starters and or heavy rotational players. Uh, good draft for Cleveland and John Dorsey. Steelers, I'm up on their draft as well. They had nine picks. The Devin Bush pick was great. I love that pick. Justin Lane, great value at 83, the cornerback. Benny Snell Jr. put behind James Conner at 122. Zach Gentry, the tight end, he's going to be their Jesse James replacement. So good pick there for Pittsburgh. Good draft for them as well. AFC South, Houston had eight picks. I'm up on their draft. I'm up on every draft in the AFC South. I liked all of them, what they did. Uh, Titus Howard, the tackle. You know, you got to go strong, try and help uh, Deshaun Watson. So you bring in the tackle at 23, a tackle at 55, Max Sharping. You bring in a Kale Waring tight end, a big tight end, a blocking tight end, a guy who can get up the seam at 86. And then Charles Omenu, the defensive end at 161, is great value at that pick. You also get the local kid fullback, Colin Gillespie, who, you know, we all saw his video. Great moment there for him. The Colts. Ended up with nine picks in this draft. Those nine picks, I think they hit on the first three guys that could probably start and or will contribute early in Rocky Sen at 34. The corner at 49, Ben Benogu, the outside linebacker. And then at 59, uh, Paris Campbell, the wide receiver, he's going to be the guy on the opposite side of T.Y. Hilton that takes some of the double coverage off of him. And you pair him with um, Andrew Luck, and you've got a good combination there. So the Colts really did well with their nine picks, getting depth, building a team. That's more so than anything what the Colts did here. They built a team with their nine picks and got some guys that very well could be longtime starters. Uh, The Jaguars, they had seven picks. They take Josh Allen at 7. Nice pickup there. Jawan Taylor, the tackle at 35. Josh Oliver, the tight end at 69. Good value at both the 35th and 69th pick for Jawan Taylor and Josh Oliver, like Jacksonville's draft. They also get a backup for Nick Foles and Gardner Minshew at 178. Titans, they get Jeffrey Simmons. This one I do have question marks next to because of his character, uh, because of the videos and the, 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 the violence with women that he's been a part of. Uh, but as a strictly as a player, great pickup at 19. And A.J. Brown at 51, great value there at wide receiver. I like their draft for only having six picks. Uh, just final, Boston has beat Milwaukee by 22 points in game one of that series, the Eastern Conference semifinals, as the four seed dominates Milwaukee in Milwaukee. Who? This is going to be a fun series. Milwaukee's going to have to come back because the Celtics are a deep team and they just put it on them. So the Celtics join Toronto as having 1-0 leads in the Eastern Conference semifinals as Toronto put it on Philadelphia yesterday as well. All right, back to the AFC East. The Bills, they had eight picks. I'm kind of so-so on their draft. It's like, okay, whatever, average draft, got some guys. I do like the pick of Ed Oliver at nine defensive tackle he's going to play all over that line mcdermott's going to enjoy using him and i also like voshan joseph the inside linebacker at 147 i think they got great value with that pick the dolphins they're face it their whole draft came out to the trade for josh rosen they get the quarterback they want a guy that has a lot of potential some talent we'll see how he works there they don't have a very good offensive line in miami they only take They take two offensive linemen in this draft. Um, I'm kind of questioning their picks at 233, 234. They take two straight running backs in Chandler Cox and Miles Gaskin. I do like their pick at 13 of Christian Wilkins, the defensive tackle. New England seems like they have one of the better drafts every year. Uh, They had 10 picks this year. I'm high on their draft. They hit Nikhil Harry at 32. I think they hit a home run. 
value wise, the fact that that's the first receiver Bill Belichick has ever taken in the first round should tell you a lot. He's a big bodied guy. He's going to give them. A, he's going to take up some of that Rob Gronkowski catches that are gone, and he, Rob Gronkowski could still come back. It could be after a training camp type thing. He decides I still want to play. So we'll see how that goes. At seventy seven, the Pats get Chase Winovich, outside linebacker, going to be a Rob, Rob Nikovich type. He's going to be a good pick for him. I like Damian Harris, the running back they get at 87. Uh, Halati Forholt, the guard at 118. Uh, solid playing guard. Can't remember what country he's from, so I'm not going to guess. At 133, I like Jarrett Stidham, the quarterback, to come in and be Brady's backup. I like the punter they took at 163, Jake Bailey, getting it one of the top punters that was available. So good draft for New England, typical draft for New England. They get a little bit of offense, a little bit of defense. Some guys are going to start depth, guys they can develop. Just a solid draft for New England once again. The Jets have six picks, kind of an okay draft for them. I do like the pick at three of Quinn and Williams, uh, the Ja'Kai Poli, uh pick at 68, and the Chuma Edga. Ed go Ed Oga tackle pick at 92. I like all of those for the Jets. AFC West. Denver had six picks. I like Denver's draft for the second year in a row. Uh, I like the Noah Fant pick. I like the Dalton Reisner pick a lot. He will start for them day one. Uh, Drew Locke, I question that pick only because if you're going to take Drew Locke, which we all thought you were coming up to this draft, why not trade back into the first round and get the fifth year option on the kid? He, you're going to have him sit behind Flacco, get the fifth year option in case Flacco only goes this year, two years, and then you can still be able to develop your team having that extra year of him on his rookie deal like they did with Russell Wilson in Seattle. Instead, you've got him for four years at the 42nd pick. And now if Flacco does play two, three, four years, you're looking at a guy that, okay, maybe you trade and don't keep around. So then why, if you're not planning on him being somehow involved sooner than later, my problem with that pick is where they took him, at 42. You trade back up to get him at 42 because you had the pick at 41. I like Denver's pick at 187, Jawan Winfrey, the wide receiver out of Colorado. Uh, you know, I think there's a couple guys on Denver's team that might want to look out because he's definitely going to be more of a slot probably type receiver. He's kind of an undersized outside guy, but he could play there as well. He's got some ability, some special teams ability. We'll see how he pans out. Kansas City, I'm a little uh-uh on their six picks. I like the Kalen Saunders pick because of his versatility and athleticism as a big man. Pretty much the only reason I like that. Uh, Darwin Thompson at 214. McCole Hardman, the wide receiver at 56. Could be a sign that maybe they're not thinking of bringing back a Tyreek Hill with all the stuff that broke with him this weekend. That investigation's broke back open after they were going to close it because they couldn't prove who committed the crime they just knew a crime had happened then the audio comes out you know if i'm kansas city i'm telling tyree kill the same thing that i told kareem hunt by felicia like i don't need guys like that around it's a privilege you can go earn money for your family and pay the bills another way it is 100 percent a privilege to be able to play this game at that level for that amount of money it doesn't matter if that's the skill set that you have best in your life to do it at that level for that money. It is a privilege that he no longer deserves, in my opinion. L.A. Chargers, uh, at 28, I, I'm high on their draft with their seven picks. Jerry Tillery, I like a lot. Nasir Adderley, the safety at 60, I like a lot. Amiki Ekbule, the outside linebacker at 200, I like a lot. A uh, good draft for the Chargers. Get some extra pieces, build in depth in case guys go down on a team that was in the playoffs last year. Raiders have nine picks. McCoy and um, Gruden through their first draft. Their first three picks in the first round. Kellen Farrell at four. Josh Jacobs at 24. And Jonathan Abram at 27. All hits, all starters. I like the Hunter Renfro pick at 149. A lot of teams had their eyes on him as well. So good draft for the Raiders with those nine picks. Uh, the best drafts in the AFC, in my opinion, were held by the Raiders, the Patriots, the Colts, and the Browns. 
In the NFC, I have to say the Cardinals, Washington, the Bucks, and the Vikings. The Vikings, just because of the amount of draft capital, those 12 picks, you can't beat capital. You can't beat getting younger. You can't beat having more competition. So 12 picks really puts them over in that division. If it weren't for the 12 picks, I probably would have gone with my Detroit Lions as having the best draft because they hit in a lot of areas where they have needs. They hit in a lot of areas where they had a lot of injuries last year um, and where they didn't get You know, maybe if you were going to grade them out as A players at every spot, they got solid players at a lot of those spots. So I probably would have gone that way if not for the draft capital for the Vikings. And then Seattle, honorable mention, the only team I'll put in is honorable mention because they went from having four picks in this draft to 11 picks in this draft. That is huge. That is impressive. And again, they are using their draft capital to get it going there in Seattle. All right, so we talked a little bit about the NBA playoffs. Bucks and Celtics caught you up there. Golden State and Houston, they're getting ready to kick off here shortly. Now, last night, Game 7, Denver and San Antonio, I was able to watch this game. It didn't look like either team wanted to win that game. Both teams could not make a shot. Denver continued to get up by 10, 12, 13 points at a time. Couldn't hit threes. Neither te- Both teams from three-point last night range were horrible. Jokic was probably the only star getting another triple double in the playoffs last night. Um, and still he didn't play that well. It seemed like everybody was off. Nobody was making shots. Passes weren't crisp. And then you get them down to the end of the game. Denver gets an eight point lead with about two, three minutes left. They let it get down to a two point game. And ultimately they survive. Somebody had to win. And in this case, it was Denver. Denver moves on to face portland uh portland and san antonio i think would have been an easy series for portland dillard with the way he's playing maybe he carries them right through denver but i like the way denver matches up with portland i don't know exactly what their their record was against each other in the regular season but i'm looking forward to that matchup for denver and portland kicking off tomorrow night i believe monday in denver all right now it's time for me to pay tribute to um, my Little League coach, Bob Nolan, was in the U.S. military, uh, and he passed last night. Uh, health conditions finally caught up with him. He's been struggling with his health for the past you know, year, two years or so, and I was fortunate enough to catch up with him last year uh, after he had taken a turn for the worst and was having some breathing issues and just catch up with him, let him know what he meant to me and what he meant to so many. And he's been a coach since the late 80s, as far as I know, 87, 88, maybe even earlier than that. So he's touched the lives of thousands of people, and he he did it because he cared. Um, Almost never did he have a salary for the teams that he coached. Almost never did he get anything but maybe a thank you or a coach's trophy at the end of the season for all of the things that he did. He was a huge OU football fan. He was from Oklahoma, uh, passed away in Florida down with some of his family members that were down there as he moved down there for health reasons to try and you know extend his life and have more moments with everybody that he cared about. But he did it for the kids. He did it. He was about sports. He was about the kids. He was about fun. He was about the purity of the game. He was about teaching and coaching. And me personally, we won city titles. We won state titles. We were involved in national uh, tournaments where we took third. And all of that stuff was great. The winning was great. The fun was great. The brotherhood that was created from those teams I cherish to this day. basketball football i had the privilege of having him be the coach for both my dad was the coach for both great men great men they honored their country they honored their their teams they honored their players and to bob nolan i thank you sir for all the lessons that i've learned from you from the lessons i've learned from you looking back that i've gotten older that i've understood as i've become older i thank you Your players thank you. And as real as you were, each and every day at practice, 
getting the most out of us, getting the best out of us. Until next time, you know how we do. We're going to be as real as Coach Bob Nolan was. Wildcat Gold, one pride, yeah!